Thank you very much, Blair. Uh, my goodness, uh, it's really a privilege to be here in Australia. I was thinking when your shadow minister was talking that this is the land. I'm coming from the tumult in Washington, and Australia seems to me very much a land of civility and calm. Uh, I want to thank uh, Stephen House particularly and his colleagues, Ashley and others, uh, at the uh, Development Policy Institute. And of course, it's a great pleasure to realize that this conference is co-hosted by the Asia Foundation, a group I've long admired uh, since I first came into acquaintance with the work of Asia Foundation in Vietnam a long time ago and saw how well embedded it is in each country and how important that is. Um, the last thing I want to say is I found very civilizing and bespeaks something about values in Australia, this allusion uh, to the uh, traditional custodians of the land. So it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to say one word about CGD's work, the Center for Global Development, which I think <coughs> is interesting and important, even though it is not particularly the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. But <clears throat> CGD's mission is, as is the case for so many of you here, to reduce poverty and inequality in the world. <clears throat> the focus of our work, however, has been primarily on what the rich world can do to improve the lives of people in the developing world. And so we look at not only aid, but at migration issues, trade, uh, climate, the climate challenge, technology transfer, the whole range of decisions and policies and behavior in a rich part of the world, including obviously Australia, that have good or bad effects. And so our policy push has very much been to, uh, for example, <coughs> try to tell DFOT how to do better, <laughs> in a way. So I wonder if Ashley, or S Ashley's probably gone to worry about other things, but I'd like to have a signal at 30 minutes. Great, so there's plenty of time for Q&A, and I do sometimes tend to talk too much. <coughs> so my topic is strugglers. Uh, this century's new development <laughs> challenge. And the idea of this talk is to try to bring you along to a somewhat different lens on the development challenges in this century compared to the 20th century, when we can look back and say there's been a tremendous amount of success. And it's symbolized most commonly by the reality that uh, billions of people were lifted out of poverty. But I want to talk about, uh, <coughs> I want to start with this gentleman. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the name Mohammed Bouazizi. <coughs> in uh, 2010, it's already seven years ago, in December of 2010, uh, Mohammed Bouazizi is the gentleman who immolated himself uh, in a town south of, um, in southern Tunisia, and triggered, he was kind of the spark, his immolation, self-immolation triggered the Arab Spring when there was a wave of hope for a change, a big changes in the direction of democracy uh, and more integration and <coughs> all of the good things about good government in the Arab world. So when he immolated himself, I looked, uh, tried to understand where he stood in the world in terms of a simple measure, I'm an economist, his income, his likely income. And what I discovered is that he was definitely not a poor man. Uh, he, thank you very much, <clears throat> he was not poor. Indeed, in the newspaper reports, it was told that he gave away he had a vegetable cart, which he brought into the center of town and sold his produce there. 
And at the end of the day and sometimes the end of the week, he gave what hadn't been sold to the poor. On the other hand, why did he immolate himself? It's because, in effect, he was being harassed by the police. He obviously <coughs> lived in what he must have felt, and many of his ilk must have felt, was a kind of rigged society, um, a corrupt society. The police were bugging him either to pay for a license more often than he might, or just extorting money from him for the right to be in the village center selling vegetables from his cart. And what happened one day, the day he immolated himself, is that they took away his cart, they got irritated and angry. Um, <clears throat> they took away his cart and the scale that he used to measure the weights of his produce. Um, and he obviously had come to a point of great frustration and anger uh, about the way society was working. So it didn't work out, the Arab Spring, um, but I think we should still, in, indeed maybe that's why we should think back to the plight of people who are not under the World Bank poverty line of $1.90 a day, but are clearly far from anything you or I sitting here in Canberra would think of as a relatively secure middle class. So I'm asking you to, you know, many of you will know much of what I'm saying, but uh, I want you to sort of think of what I call this group, the strugglers or the strivers. Uh, why do they matter? How do they matter? So the idea of the talk is to first explain the struggler classification in crude economic terms, as you'll see, based on uh, numbers between $4 a day and $10 a day. <clears throat> then to talk a little bit about the characteristics of the people in the world who are in this crude category between $4 and $10 a day of household income per capita. Then to talk about why they matter, and including, you know, I hope to hear from you, <laughs> because you know your region far better than I do. You heard I was at the Inter-American Development Bank. I know a lot more about Latin America, and I've done much more in Africa than in um, Southeast Asia. Africa, India, but not so much Southeast Asia. And then to go on to what to th how to think about, how should a, a sort of recognition of this group change the way <coughs> we think in the development field and change a little bit what we think is important to do. So a little uh, with a focus on the role of outsiders. <coughs> And going back to, excuse me, the DC, CGD mission of what can outsiders do to supplement and help the uh, movements inside countries for uh, development, for improved <coughs> lives for more people. So let me start with this picture. that shows you, you don't really have to figure it out, I'll explain it, but it's meant to convince you that there's something to this. Uh, this is a picture based on uh, data collected in a panel, a set of panel surveys in three countries of Latin America over five years or so, three to five years. And what it's telling you is uh, if you live between $4 a day and $10 a day, between the two vertical lines, in those countries, uh, you have a relatively high probability of returning below what the country poverty lines are, which is around $4 a day. So in the case of uh, living, people living at $6 a day per capita, which is probably where Mohammed Bouazizi's family was, um, he had a large family, he was the sole breadwinner, he was the big brother, he was putting his sister, uh, hoping to get her through secondary school, maybe even get her to the university. So maybe five or six dollars a day household income uh, in, in that family. Uh, if you have six dollars a day, uh, you have more than a 40% chance of falling back into poverty over a period of three years. <coughs> 
if you get up to $10 a day, your probability declines to about 10%. So with other economists, particularly working on Latin America, there's been a kind of sense that $10 a day is a reasonable line for joining the middle class. Uh, it's reasonable in the sense of that's when you become materially secure. You will not be necessarily secure if there's a long economy-wide recession or depression. And so we know that the middle class in some countries of the West, say in the 1930s in Germany, was hit very hard. Uh, and, was the, and there's a lot of discussion in the US now about the hollowing out of the middle class because median wages have not, have been stagnant for so long. But I'm not talking about those big shocks, I'm talking about household shocks. You know, as in the case of Bouazizi, it was a shock. His assets, his productive assets, were destroyed. So, and he had borrowed the day before to buy the vegetables that he was selling. So he was he, in debt, in effect. <clears throat> That's a household shock, or a child gets sick and so on. So the strugglers can be defined as those who are vulnerable to falling back into poverty. And many of you know who study development that there's a lot of churning around the poverty line. This is telling you, you know, of say $2 a day that people go back and forth. There's been evidence of that now for some decades. But this, what this is telling us is that it's, the churning can occur at higher levels of income. And that in effect, from some sort of emotional or psychological point of view, your life does not change at $1.91 a day. It only begins to change when you get up closer to something like $10 a day. So this is a picture, uh, again, it's a little bit confusing, you don't really need to figure it out. Some of you will know that recently the World Bank decided to add poverty lines that are higher than $1.90 a day for, uh, and they're set at uh, $3.20 for lower middle income countries and $5.50 for upper middle income countries. So that's very interesting. It's recognizing that poverty is relative and I think it helps underline the point that people in some income category well above $1.90 a day are still, or can still be very poor if you think of poverty in a multi-dimensional sense in terms of the multi many deprivations and the pressures and the stress and the anxieties that are associated with can I feed my family if not day to day, certainly week to week. So that, I sh I'm just showing you this to reemphasize <coughs> the idea that the strugglers are the new poor and should be thought of in the development community as the new poor of this century. <clears throat> so we cannot, we can celebrate the reduction in extreme poverty that's occurred over the last 20, 25 years. But at the same time, we have to see as a big challenge what to do about the struggler group. Now, how big is this group? It's really huge. Uh, in this graph, the red is the poor and orange are the strugglers, okay? So in 1990, which is the top line, you can see that in the developing world, most people were really amongst the extreme poor. But if you go down to 2030, you see that in the developing world, reasonable projections based on growth, you know, projections for countries aggregated suggests that strugglers will still constitute 60% of the population of the developing world. It's about the same as now. It's still 60%. Some people will be moving into the middle class. You know, this is very mechanical in a way uh, with growth. By the way, the underlying projections assume no changes within countries in the distribution of income. So it's just imposing mechanically growth that's hoped for in the next 10 or 15 years on uh, applying it across the board 
using whatever distribution now of the benefits of growth prevails in any particular country. So this is, picture is just another way of saying in the last 25 years, uh, things have changed dramatically in the way we should envision in our heads what is going on in the developing world and what, is li what life is like for most people. Um, you also see in the green the growth of the middle class, and I'm going to, co going to come back to that in a few minutes. But let me say, you know, just another factoid. 80% of the developing country population uh, lives under $10 a day today. And ask yourself, what percent of the rich world population lives under $10 a day? And think of a number and it's estimated to be 2.5%. These are really different worlds. So this is just a quick picture of uh, what's behind those projections showing a doubling uh, of the middle class, <coughs> which is the green line, in the last uh, 25 years, more or less, since 1990. The middle class is now about 20% of the developing world, if we count $10 and above as middle class or rich. In the same time period, people have moved out of extreme poverty and the number of strugglers in the developing world has also almost doubled. So where do they live? The point here, the, the size of the circles is um, related to the numbers of people across countries and most strugglers live in the middle income countries including, of course, in this part of the world, in uh, the countries that, you know, I hear you all talking about, the question of more aid for countries that are already middle income. And I suppose part of this picture says they probably need not only aid but other kinds of help uh, and will for s quite a long time. Development is a long haul game. Uh, you see in the lower income countries, the licks, there are not so many strugglers. Uh, that's the poorest countries in Africa and South Asia. Uh, they're there, but really the, it's still the fact that most people are below even $1.90 a day. So here's a picture that gives you a sense of, uh, it's the same thing. In 2030, across these countries, if you combine the red and the orange, the poor and the strugglers, uh, it's the overwhelming majority of um, people in countries including uh, Pakistan, India. But I added Indonesia to this picture to emphasize that Indonesia is, a, is different from Ethiopia and Tanzania but not as different as you might think if you only went to Jakarta or Bali, right? So uh, this is a picture that does the same thing with uh, the middle class in green, and the countries are ranked from left to right in order of per capita GDP. And so what you see, again, with, uh, well, Indonesia's not in this picture. I'm not sure why. It got a, oh, yes, it is. Okay. So you see how large the struggler group is compared to the middle class in green. Uh, and the same in Sri Lanka. I was actually surprised about Sri Lanka. Um, in Ch Sorry? No. I'm looking myself. China. Then you see the contrast with several countries in Latin America, Colombia and Brazil, and with Thailand, an upper middle income country, with, uh, uh, you know, n now up to 50% uh, as over $10 middle class. And maybe I'll, I'll come to this a little more later. That is interesting because it is in countries like Thailand and Brazil with a large middle class that you're having a lot of <coughs> some people I would think of as perhaps healthy political disruption as more people are more engaged 
and have the time to engage with the political systems. <laughs> um, you probably know Thailand better than I do and you'll think, well, what does that mean? Uh, maybe I should just invoke Brazil where there's huge corruption scandals going on now, including with uh, Lula, who's the former president likely to run again. Um, and some people say, oh, you know, sign of a problem. Uh, the middle class doesn't solve things. But another way of looking at it is when more people are middle class, there's larger civil society movements, more active politics, big increase in the number of NGOs, all of those things that we associate with the willingness to demand from government accountability. Um, so I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So what are the key characteristics of strugglers beyond this crude income classification? Um, so I'll go through that quickly. You know, first, they are mostly living in urban and peri-urban areas. Uh, in rural areas, at least in Africa and South Asia, you know, poverty, extreme poverty is more common. They have primary schooling. Um, this is a very complicated graph. No need to f try to figure it out. But what it's saying is that across <laughs> Latin America, where we could look at data that was able to be analyzed because it was micro household data uh, and isolate four to ten dollars and then look at how much education people in that group had. And it's basically primary education, sometimes completed primary education. And the bottom half of the graph shows, for those of you who know about these things, you know the standard errors around the mean. And there are people with secondary education several years in many countries in Latin America who are living at incomes below $10 a day per capita in their households. So it's not a simple story from that point of view at any one point in time. But what is fascinating is that if you look at Honduras, one of the poorest countries in Latin America in 1980, and you look at Chile, one of the richest countries in 2015, on average, people under $4 don't have yet full primary education. $4 to $10 strugglers, on average, have primary education. It's really interesting in terms of, you know, what is it in terms of in human, that links human capital, the ability to read at least a little bit and write, to productivity reflected in <coughs> average income is sort of oddly stable over time and across countries. So there's a, you can feel optimistic about that in the sense that if you could get more children through more schooling where they're actually learning something, uh, they will be more productive. This is a very indirect way of showing something that economists and others have argued <laughs> for many decades. So uh, on average primary education, relatively low human capital. Um, this picture is meant to sort of presage, it's easier to say, most strugglers are informal. They're, they're both informal sector workers and they work as informal workers a combination of those two things. Again, this is from data uh, from Latin America, and I labeled it there in the in-between sectors, between agriculture and formal sector jobs. That's what these crossing lines are basic, basically showing you for different countries. Uh, this is a <coughs> very interesting graph from a new study out of the Overseas Development Institute in the UK, and uh, the title of their study is Informality, the New Normal, or something like that. And they're making two points. First, most people in developing countries uh, who are not middle class or rich work in the informal sectors. And they have and they will be for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So, you know, I think we all have a tendency to think of inequality even in the rich world as associated going all the way back to Marx between workers who have a pay stub but a low wage and the rich 
who have a pay stub or benefit also from capital income, but it's the pay stub workers who are the working class and uh, the fighters for you know better lives, and that's at the roots of the liberal parties around the world, um, and now worryingly <laughs> sort of associated in mature democracies with the rise of populism and, and the right. It's a different world out there in the developing countries. <coughs> Pretty much most of, po of the populations in most countries don't have a pay stub. They live with vulnerability. They live with anxiety. That's the point here. I mean, this shows the share of employment for non-agricultural workers from the poorest countries at the top to the richest countries at the bottom. So the message is, and this is something that's particularly the case for women, because this includes a lot of a lot of female-headed households, of course, are in, do informal kinds of work. And uh, we'll come later a little bit to the costs of that as well as the benefits. So this is Indonesia uh, in the middle here. You can read along. It's basically showing you the same thing, that the poor and strugglers in non-agricultural work in, in Indonesia, they make up 90% of uh, informal workers. So I wanted, so that's sort of education and work, you know, what's the characteristics of strugglers. Um, some of you might be familiar with this relatively famous elephant graph of Branko Milanovic. Um, and uh, I want to just talk about this a little bit in the context of trying to suggest another aspect of being a struggler which in the first place is uh, most strugglers out there have succeeded. They've lifted themselves out of poverty. They're the ones who migrated from rural areas uh, to peri-urban and urban areas, who had enough education, they had enough capital initially to at least move, so on. They are the orange group. I've drawn it here, redrawn it a little bit, to, so it coincides with actual <coughs> along the horizontal axis uh, daily income per capita. So they're the back of the elephant that had captured a lot of the benefits of growth in the developing world. And you know, behind this is the story of globalization. And if you're a development person, you're sort of a globalist. And it's important to recognize how good Global economic globalization has been for fostering, um, for improving the lives of the poor and lifting people out of poverty, right? So behind that economic globalization is a, a view of development where I think we should all be globalists, which is a little different from globalization, but we should embrace globalism. And this takes us back to the tumult in Washington and the call of uh, Senator Wong for a bipartisan <coughs> agreement because it reflects the idea that in this world we should all be global citizens in our own interests as well as reflecting our values. Anyway, the strugglers are, ha, were big gainers from what happened between the 1988 and 2011. That's the data that Branko Milanovic put across, uh, used to, to draw this graph. On the far, then you see the middle class in the developing world in green have also gained, this is how much they captured of growth. So they haven't lost <coughs> out, uh, but in relative terms, a little bit less than strugglers. And of course, the rise of populism and so on, you know, the reason the graph became famous is over on the right, you have the losers in the rich world. US middle class are the big losers right here. Boom, compared to the richer 1% and 0.01% and so on. And now we know from new work of Piketty that many of you will know his name and the well-known book, Capital, that this phenomenon in India is just extraordinary. It's something like the point, top 0.01% uh, of, of the rich, of this population at the top end in India 
has captured something like the same amount of growth as the bottom 50% of the population. So this, is, this graph is illustrating something that's going on in the world in terms of the way we think about inequality and who's benefiting, who's gaining, and who's losing. Um, however, <coughs> a colleague of mine at the center <coughs> used data since 2011 to update the elephant, and he calls it the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> and in this graph, on the far right, you go beyond the 99th percentile to, you know, point 0.1 at the top and point 0.01 and point 0.001 and so on. Um, based on more scrutiny by Piketty and others using countries like India that have tax data because the elephant graph is based solely on household survey data where there's considerable underreporting at the top of the distribution. And so it doesn't really capture the extent to which the rich have captured so many of the benefits. So when you redraw it and you take into account which parts of the population captured the most, uh, you see that the strugglers in the first, well, you can see them labeled two to $10 in this graph. They've still done well, but not as well. And this is interesting in the context of the growing concern about inequality within countries. And what I called, you know, expectations maybe aren't being met for continued growth among strugglers who were successful in moving out of poverty. And they are still living in an anxious world. 30 minutes? Great. Okay, thanks. So let me go to a little bit about why strugglers matter that it goes a little closer to not only the economics but the politics of what we're talking about. Uh, this is a picture, by the way, from rioting in Brazil in Sao Paulo, I think, or Rio de Janeiro, when bus fares were increased. And we did a little analysis at CGD of um, if at median income in the city of Rio that increase in the bus fare would take a substantial portion, too substantial, out of uh, the pockets of people who take those two-hour bus rides, strugglers, in and out of the city. So they went to the streets, uh, they or the middle class. We don't really know because we didn't have a chance to survey people in the streets. All right, so the middle class and the state. Um, take a quick read, and I'll take a drink of water, of what Aristotle had to say. So I guess the point of this slide and, and the message for me is that the middle class is a different phenomenon politically in that the middle class has the income to actually support government and government services through the tax system. And because if the middle class pays taxes, it has an instrument in principle to hold government accountable. So it's not as though the middle class solves all problems of bad governance, not at all. Um, the middle class can create problems, particularly if they're trying to compete with their view of the privileged insider elites who have all kinds of political rents and so on. But it may be that overall it helps as you have more people going into the middle class. So one way to think about development is building a middle class society in which there's a group of people who can afford to pay taxes that allows for all the social services that helps create sound, sustained institutions and holds the political actors accountable. Now, there's a lot of talk about other benefits of the middle class, particularly, you know, creating more demand for consumption, taking reasonable risks, and so on. But that's the one that I think is the most interesting in terms of why it's different to be in a society where most people are strugglers than to be in a society 
where at least 50% or 45% of people are in the middle class. Now, the fact is that in your, the countries, um, the, the lower middle income countries, many of which are Indonesia and company, Sri Lanka and so on, Papua New Guinea, the countries that I hear about when I'm uh, in this part of the world, they are, they have very small proportion of population in the middle class. It's only Thailand, as I said, Malaysia, of course, where there's a larger middle class. And one way to think about it is in terms of absolute tax revenues, which are, it's amazing actually. This shows, you know, Ethiopia has $73 a year per person in tax revenue. The OECD countries have over $13,000 a year per person in tax revenue. Indonesia, about $400 a year in revenues per person, the Indonesian government. So it helps when your middle class gets larger, just on the simple measure of tax revenue. You have more people to tax. Um, and this, you know, for those of you who might be political scientists, talk of the median voter. The median voter in Brazil is a struggler, right? So that makes it hard. And in, Bra in Brazil, they have actually collect too many taxes per person, but we can talk about that. And even in Brazil, don't try to figure this out because I want to stop in a few minutes. Um, even in Brazil, strugglers lose out. They are net payers into the tax system, mostly because of indirect taxes, consumption, the VAT, trade taxes, and all of those things. Um, the rich do pay more, but not in any sense proportionately more because of the absence of property taxes in particular, I would argue, and taxes on capital. In Indonesia, the median voter is poor. Again, it just gives you a feel for the difficulty of having the resources to become a good government when you are a struggler society. In India, and these are, you know, density distributions of, the, of income, uh, the median, it's $1.60 a day in PPP terms of consumption, but m India is still a society of the truly poor. It's amazing, actually. So let me go quickly to what to do and what to think. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention for those of you who think about these things, like at the Development Policy Institute, <laughs> is economic growth matters enormously. <clears throat> That's what brought us a world where most people are strugglers in the developing world rather than poor. Uh, and the macro fundamentals we know have been incredibly important. Uh, in this process. In Africa, from 2000 to 2015, average growth per capita per year was uh, 5%, the highest in the world for a re sub-Saharan region, the highest in the world for any region. And it was all based on just getting, you know, dealing appropriately with macro management. So I wanted to say that. But also, obviously, from so much of what I've said, it's inclusive growth that matters. And for that, you need an active, effective state. So what to do if you're a development thinker, a development advocate, for maybe the thinkers, you know, more focus on how to improve productivity in the informal sector itself. It, the answer is not manufacturing. So the old story of structural change and growth isn't going to work. We, have, we will have in high levels of informality for another 10 to 15 years, straight through 2030, the year of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, more focus on social insurance, not just redistribution, social cash transfers for the extreme poor, but setting up systems of social insurance from which most strugglers in most countries do not benefit, pensions, health insurance, and so on. The politics of tax policy that I've alluded to a little bit, design of automatic stabilizers. Be careful when the IMF says you have to reduce food fuel subsidies. They're right in the medium term, 
But in the short run, there will be many people in the struggler group who absolutely cannot afford to buy kerosene if you increase the price by 50%. So that there's a transition. And all the issues of universal basic income and distribution of natural resource rents, countries like PNG, some new thinking about how to make transfer programs work within countries as well as across countries. In the, in the age of robots, you know, the obsession with problems of automation, true, but you know, that is not necessarily the best way to think about the future of work in the developing world. Uh, development thinkers have to sort of take, think about a new way to think about it. And then finally, what to do, the role of outsiders. You know, I thought much of what the shadow minister said was really great and so wonderfully e evidence-based. So I'm not adding anything new here, except to focus on beyond aid, constructing a just global system. Trade, technology, the things that I mentioned, CGD worries about, support for the multilateral institutions and globalism, support for NGOs and civil society and think tanks in the developing world. Maybe because I'm a think tank person, I can't believe how little support there is for independent thinking within countries uh, that people who can become uh, you know, watchdogs for their own governments. And then finally, of course, the problem of collective action I didn't put it down here in a global system, you know, what to do about climate change, what to do about uh, pandemic disease risk, what to do about the lack of research into agriculture uh, for countries that still have very low agricultural productivity, on and on, the SDGs and the Paris Accord. Let me end on a high note. Thank you very much. <laughs>
you know, and not le débat, kind of. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, d I think it's easy to, uh, many people who study Africa say it's all about colonialism, but why, what are, you know, the question is why has it gone on too long that there is still whatever burdens having been colonies imposed still matters. So on the one hand, yes, history matters. On the other hand, it's time to f figure out and think intelligently about how these things from the past, in the case of indigenous people here, how they ca are sustained and then what to do about it. Effective, active state. Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, I'm just wondering if you have much to do with the WHO High uh, Level Commission on Health, Employment and Economic Growth. And I think that commission looked at quite a new interesting way. I think if we recognize healthy communities are obviously a benefit for any society, but the influence of this CHI commission was looking at the economic growth of actually putting more resources into health so that actually the whole society can actually support the health systems from the farmer who produces the food to the, the local unemployed youth who can maybe help with maintenance to a whole variety of health professionals. And I think it's an angle we haven't maybe looked at and it certainly fits, <coughs> seems to fit with your model. Um, yeah, I don't know the report. I bet one of, one of my colleagues at the center, we have a lot of really wonderful work on health issues. Uh, does know about that WHO report. Let me just say that your question, you know, reminds me to say that we do know now from research that living with anxiety and stress is, is really bad news for people. I mean, there are a lot of good studies uh, in the U.S. of African-American children who live under a lot of stress sometimes violence at home, all of these things, discrimination itself, and that it affects their health and it affects their long-run productivity as individuals, their ability to support themselves. So I think there's, it's very interesting about strugglers, that they are struggling. You know, they also are striving, they have aspirations, but that creates a kind of stress. And it's not that different, I think, for many people in the developing world in that income group than it is for the uh, lower middle class in countries like the U.S. where the inequality problem is creating, you know, the fact that they're not benefiting and that the state and the system appears to them to be rigged and it is probably in many ways, right? So these. I think it's a great idea for that kind of a report that brings together work, productivity, stress, mental health, uh, that we're paying a very high price, even in the rich world, for the costs we impose on people associated with vulnerability and uncertainty. Um, my name's Andrew Campbell from ACR. Thank you, Nancy, for a very fascinating data-rich presentation. Much of your data appeared to focus on people in the non-agricultural economy. Many of the countries in which we work, Pakistan for example, 80% of the population still work in agriculture. And the data is very clear that um, improving agricultural productivity disproportionately benefits the poorest of the poor, but also um, is one of the most uh, cost effective ways of lifting people out of poverty. So. <coughs> How does the agricultural economy relate to your strugglers' narrative? Mm -hmm, very good. Well, I think you're right. I did some work many years ago on the success of East Asia, you know, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, Thailand. And compared to Latin America, agriculture was not taxed. In Latin America and in many other developing regions for many years, agriculture was taxed in the form of uh, overvalued exchange rates, which were good for the poor, I mean the urban poor, and the urban workers, right. So, and now I'm on the board of IFPRI, and I've learned a lot more about 
that's more up to date on what's going on. So I appreciate your question. I'm not the best person to answer it, but what, what I think is at the heart of what you're saying is about raising <coughs> agricultural productivity. And you know, agricultural productivity in Africa sort of is four times lower than in China. So big investments are needed, including in R&D, in figuring out ways, but also in the public good of extension and so on. But the future, I think, is, this is, I alluded to this when I said it's not going to be the structural shift from agriculture to manufacturing that <coughs> is so good in, in Korea and other East Asian economies. It has to be in these areas of work, including agriculture. And you know, I think agro-industry and food systems, how are food systems working? The benefits of, um, you know, data, data science and data analytics for improving food systems uh, are huge. I, so I don't know if I can add anything to your question except, I can't answer it except to say yes, absolutely. But it may not be simply raise productivity of these farmers. It may be, again, from the top down, how to connect them better to markets, obviously. In Africa, it's a complete disaster. <coughs> and the answer to con in Africa may not be ag extension and working on ag productivity with farmers. It may be building roads, you know, so that they have access to peri-urban markets. So long answer that rambled without. <laughs> Good question. And you're right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Duncan McIntosh from APNIC, the Internet Registry for the Asia Pacific. I wanted to ask about connectivity and the impact or the potential for impact on the strugglers that connectivity can provide. And do you feel there's enough research in that whole area of the benefits or possible benefits of connectivity? Yes, well, I mean, you're referring to sort of mobile money maybe, or computers, or laptops, or tablets, and the internet connection. No question, it's huge, right, for most people in developing countries. After all, it's connectivity in the rich world, including roads and bridges, uh, that has made us rich. You know, what's the big difference in many ways? It's also, it's not just computers, it's electricity. I would put a huge premium on bringing power to, so we could have a little bit more mechanization in agriculture, a little bit more, you know, like in Cambodia where there's more activity with more power connectivity, not just the sort of internet connectivity, but power, they're, they're getting rich doing milling, you know, in, in rural areas. So, but I do think we should think of the internet as a public infrastructure. And in places where it's not happening through private investment, uh, I think there are huge social returns to uh, public investment in connectivity in, in the sense that you're discussing it. Um, so we can't wait necessarily in every country for the telecommunications firms. I mean, it worked in Kenya with mobile money but the mystery still, I think, that people don't, haven't given me an answer is why is it taking so much longer in other places? And it has to do with who had the original monopoly in the telecoms area and, you know, there was one big telecom provider so they, could, they had a private return to investing in the places where, blah, 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 long story. Those of you, many of you may know more about this than I do, but it had to do with the central bank hands off back to good policy at the top. So, you know, development is about um, doing the right thing at the sort of macro and meta level uh, and the regulatory areas as well as addressing the needs of people on the ground. So connectivity is a great subject in that way, especially if it's thought of in broader terms, not just the internet, but we all need more connections uh, and certainly strugglers do to be 
able to be more productive and thus richer. <laughs> we had a question right up the top of here. Um, so while, while the microphone's making its way, can I extend that question, take the chair of, or the prerogative of the chair, just to extend that technology question a little bit um, and, and ask you about uh, impact of uh, robots or AI or machinery. We talked a bit about manufacturing, I think a bit of a time. You, you hinted, I think, in your presentation about a 10 or 15 or 20 year window that's coming up. So there's been a lot of discussion around the impact of um, uh, robots and te technology on manufacturing and what that means for a range of countries as it's squarely in the middle of, of your data. So maybe you want to say something about that. Yes, it's, I, you know, it's really, I, I, I go between thinking, oh, absolutely, this is really an issue that has to be addressed, and thinking, the secret for structural change and long-term development is with automation, but not via manufacturing. I think we have to get past that. Uh, we know, uh, Danny Roderick refers to the phenomenon of premature deindustrialization, And what he's saying is, you know, just to give you something to hang on to, at its maximum in Korea, uh, manufacturing took up 40% of the labor force. <coughs> manufacturing has already peaked in India and is now declining. It peaked with 8% of the labor force in manufacturing. So manufacturing is good in that it, you know, leads to higher output per worker. But it, if you're concerned about, if we're all concerned about robots and AI and the effect on jobs, I just think we've got to get over this manufacturing thing. Um, Ethiopia is trying with Chinese, a lot of Chinese technical assistants to become a manufacturing powerhouse. But I have colleagues at the center who've done studies you know, the cost of labor is too high in Africa. They are not going to be able to compete with Bangladesh. And why is the cost of labor too high? Because agricultural productivity is low. And so the real cost of living and eating in urban... So this, I think your question captures a lot along with this emphasis that I was trying to put on informality about how to rethink what to do if you're in development space. Um, that it may be, you know, that we need to rejigger our approach a little bit. Uh, it, I think in the rich world, there's time. I, I'm not, you know, I'm a little bit the optimist about that. It's, it's all going to work out. <laughs> you know, my daughter, who's a doctor, will not be sort of interneted out of diagnosis work by machine learning. There will still be a need, but it'll still be different. I don't think we can foresee now what jobs will really be like, but I'm pretty confident in the rich world. It will be such a long, slow adjustment. In the developing world, it's more worrying. It's really more worrying, and too much talk of the demographic dividend without attention to the def demographic dividend is only a dividend in a good policy environment where you have an active, effective state doing some reasonable things. Thank you very much. I'm Elisa Prizzon from the Overseas Development Institute. Nice to thank you very much for your inspiring uh, keynote speech. And somehow to elaborate on the role of outsiders, uh, it would be great to hear your thoughts about uh, the role of multilateral development banks. I mean, you highlighted very clearly that most stragglers will leave, uh, leave and will leave uh, middle-income countries. And we know that some shareholders in MDBs uh, would <coughs> like their management to change programs in multilateral development banks or even stop programs in multilateral development banks. So in this particular agenda, what should uh, MDBs do differently? Thank you. Yes, well, I'm a great believer. I think you're alluding to the discussion about whether uh, the World Bank and maybe the Asian Development Bank should do less in the middle-income countries, particularly the upper middle-income countries. And remember Tunisia and Mohamed Bouazizi in that context. 
Tunisia became an upper middle income country briefly and then has fallen back <coughs> given its difficulties in recent years. It is still needing support. It may not be that we should be doing grants, you know, in upper middle income countries, but there is huge need for continued support through loans and guarantees and public-private partnerships and catalyzing investment. Uh, I've become a little bit more of a believer in, yeah, the multilateral banks have to be more bold in working on finding ways to cover the political and regulatory risks to investors associated with moving into, you know, investing in infrastructure and so on. And there's no question that infrastructure needs, including public infrastructure, consider mass transit, you know, in Mumbai or even in Bangkok, you know, we've all suffered, or many of you will have suffered with the traffic in Bangkok. So the middle, the multilateral banks are really quite good about doing and monitoring major loans to do major investments. I think at the same time, I'm a believer in charging more countries that are a little bit richer so that the subsidy they get from multilateral loans is uh, a little smaller than the subsidy. You know, it shouldn't be the same for Ghana as it is for Thailand. I don't know if Thailand even borrows, but um, <clears throat> for what's another country, Vietnam even. Um, so that's, that's my thought on, uh, I think this is coming from the US mostly, I don't know, maybe not from Australia, <laughs> from the Trump administration. Thanks, Nancy Sakalagmimana from DFAT. Um, I think the Mohammed Bouazizi story is emblematic, not only because of, the, it, because of the economic vulnerability and precariousness, but also it's very illustrative of the predations of state actors, of the humiliations of the individual in the face of petty authority. Um, and in many ways, this is as much a a problem of political management for the countries, the lower and upper middle income countries that you're talking about. Um, how much awareness do you think there is among developing country leaders of this demographic and of the kind of pressing nature of some of the policy prescriptions that you uh, were suggesting earlier? That's a really good question. It, it, and I love the way you put it, you express some of the issues better, you know, in relation to the question about ideas, humiliation, and so on. And I don't know the answer <laughs> to the question for developing countries of whether they're focused in quite this way um, at the political level. But I suppose part of my message is they ought to be, but it's not easy because the the whole point about the difference between middle class and strugglers is strugglers don't have the time, right? Or the sort of, um, they're not paying taxes, they don't have the political agency uh, to make their demands. They don't have the time to figure out what their demands are. So it's a good point. You know, um, I'd, I'd hope that development advocates and development thinkers who work in developing countries would start thinking about it that way, that you're poor, you're, you have these new poor, and we recognize it's a tough situation, you know, and if you don't start making your tax systems, that would be one message for me, more progressive, by developing systems to tax property and to tax high incomes. Uh, you, you know, you can increase consumption taxes only so much before you start uh, immiserating the strugglers, pushing them back below the poverty line. So, good point, but I don't know. The one thing I want to say, because on the question on the multilateral banks about the role of outsiders is, 
These changes in the world, the geopolitical shifts, the rise of China and countries like Brazil and Turkey, I think, you know, it isn't, I'm not always sure it's uh, internalized sufficiently, including in the banks, that until those governments take ownership of what they need to do, no amount of money and harassing. <coughs> and so I think in the aid community, I'm a big believer in um, results-based, outcome-based, ex post, paying grant money ex post when something, when progress has been shown by some measures. Not coming with a blueprint, you know, now this is what you have to do in secondary education, build the schools and train the teachers. No, no, no. It's your job in the country. It's your job. And so in Asia, many countries have succeeded on their own, like Indonesia in many areas. So more recognition than until the responsibilities with those governments and for producing results, even though they're having to do, have resources because there are so many people are poor and their tax revenue is not very high given the needs. That's sort of the role of outsiders to me is to be inspiring innovation and new ways of thinking and inter experiments. This is the way things worked out in the Western democracies, you know, incremental gains, innovation, and so on. Okay, so I've only got one more. I've got to check to see if we're going to time in. Have we got? We're out of time. Okay, Mary has had a hand up for a while, so I'm just going to ask a short question <laughs> and a short really answer. Really quick. Um, uh, Mary Moran uh, from Policy Where Cures. Are you? Sorry. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you. You've, uh, you mentioned a lot that the real things that have brought people out of poverty are not to do with aid programs. They're things like um, trade, um, threats to it would be things like. Not only with no, aid not programs. No, only, not only. But <laughs> I'm saying the, the big things have been uh, um, migration, trade agreements, those kinds of things. So, and aid programs often tend to have a bilateral or regional focus, trying to deal with the impacts of those changes. So, for instance, um, what made it impossible, very difficult for us to treat HIV patients was the World Trade Organization set the rules that govern uh, the prices of AIDS drugs. So, what I'm wondering, do you think it would be helpful for aid programs to shift their weight from bilateral regional focus, which they can tend to have, and really focus more heavily on influencing those other areas. So the trade agreements, the environment agreements, the stuff that's happening with AI, they're the things that are going to, as you've said, determine who stays in or rises from poverty. Do you think aid programs should be rebalanced a bit? Um, I think both have to be on the agenda. You know, aid, the way we think of it in a conventional sense, and work in development policy, maybe not inside the government, inside the Crawford's Development Policy Institute and ODI and CG, CGD, and civil society on, you know, it got worked out eventually, the problem with WTO rules and the pricing of HIV drugs. It took too long, lives were lost, but thanks to a huge civil society movement and the Clinton Foundation on pricing and lobbying and so on. So I'm, I think, I suppose I would say I would like more aid to go, as I said, to groups in developing countries of NGOs, civil society, think tanks, who can carry that message right, within their own countries and to the rest of the world. And there has been a huge increase in the number of NGOs. I said this yesterday to somebody in Asia and Africa that have, uh, are internationally affiliated, you know, have signed up with the UN as international NGOs. And I think that's a result in many countries of the middle class being more active. So I don't think it's an either or. Um, I do think a little bit in the premise of your question was maybe not so much the aid money in the aid community, but the larger development community, including advocates, NGOs, students, think tanks, more focus on the benefits, how to capture the benefits of migration, more focus on what to do about 
uh, distortions in trade rules or in the way they're implemented, right? More focus on technology transfer and who's going to pay for licensing certain new technologies uh, for countries in Africa. That's maybe something for the multilateral institutions to think through more. So more focus on the global system, which is what, some of what you're implying. So you give me heart that, you know, this was <laughs> something we've been trying to do at the Center for Global Development is, is focus not only on better aid, but on better policy in the broader sense in these other areas. Thanks, Nancy. Well, uh, apologies, Stephen, for running slightly over time, but I think it's a rare privilege to have someone like Nancy. So <laughs>